of a freer and more open society in England in the 18th century allowed her businessmen to begin the first industrial revolution. But on the continent, government restrictions on freedom delayed industrialization. In the hundred years after 1750, England developed an economy of such unparalleled productivity that it became known as the workshop of the world. The third and final film in this series is concerned with the effects of industrialization upon the lives of ordinary people. Was the Industrial Revolution a good or a bad thing for most people? For example, was it as bad as the elder Arnold Toynbee declared? A period as disastrous and terrible as any through which a nation ever passed. Side by side with a great increase in wealth, was seen an enormous increase in pauperism. Production on a large scale led to a rapid alienation of classes and the degradation of a large body of producers. Toynbee wrote in 1883, but already in 1830 there had been a fierce debate about the consequences of the Industrial Revolution between Robert Southey, the poet laureate, and Lord Macaulay, the historian. Southey had written the immediate and home effect of the manufacturing system is to produce physical and moral evil in proportion to the wealth which it creates. Macaulay disagreed and argued that since 1800, we must confess ourselves unable to find any satisfactory record of any great nation, past or present, in which the working classes have been in a more comfortable situation than in England. The serving man, the artisan, and the husbandman have a more copious and palatable supply of food, better clothing, and better furniture. The same disagreement can be found today. When Nobel Prize winner Bertrand Russell wrote, The Industrial Revolution caused unspeakable misery, both in England and America. Nobel Prize winner F.A. Hayek replied, that this view is based on a myth. The legend of the deterioration of the position of the working classes in consequence of the rise of the industrial system. Such disagreement between such distinguished scholars has caused confusion among students. No wonder an American historian has declared there was probably never a more blatant case in the history of economics of two opposing schools of thought derived from a single set of phenomena. We asked Professor R. M. Hartwell of the University of Oxford for his view of this great debate. To me, the debate is a strange one because it is based on an apparent paradox. A massive increase in the production of goods and services relatively to population, along with an alleged reduction in the standard of living. To settle the issue, we must look to the facts of history. As this worker's cottage here in the north of England Open Air Museum demonstrates, the facts of history are against those who believe that living standards moved downwards during the Industrial Revolution. On the contrary, the facts of history show that between 1750 and 1850, average real income per head in England increased between 50 and 100 percent. Over the entire 19th century, there was a fourfold increase. When these figures are translated into goods, the most obvious change was in the amount and the variety of consumer goods available to the English people. Comparing the 18th with the 19th century, there was a general change from a meagerness of personal possessions and a low consumption to a growing ownership of possessions and a higher consumption. The Great Exhibition, with its 17,000 exhibits, demonstrated the choices of a consumer-oriented society. England, in its profusion and diversity of goods, had become the first consumer society, a society in which production was geared to consumer satisfaction and in which consumer choice was greatly extended. The Industrial Revolution was a revolution in production, and it is relevant to ask what happened to the goods produced. The answer is that the great bulk of these products were consumed by the British people themselves supplemented by an ever-increasing stream of imports.
and increasing consumption was not confined to manufactured goods. Comparing eating habits in the 1850s, a contemporary observer concluded, how much better an Englishman is fed than anyone else in the world. Grain and meat production in Britain, for example, kept pace with the growth of population. And diversity of produce was increased with the expansion of orchards and market gardens, for example, in the Thames Valley near London. And with the growth of the fishing industry, especially in the North Sea, imports further expanded the quantity and variety of foods available, increasing the consumption of beverages, tea, coffee and cocoa. Large imports of rice and currants, for example, supplemented the domestic production of grain and fruit. By 1840, large quantities of perishable foods, livestock, poultry, meat, butter, cheese and eggs, were imported regularly from abroad. By 1850, the Londoner, on average, was consuming each week five ounces of butter, 30 ounces of meat, 56 ounces of potatoes, and 16 ounces of fruit. This compares favorably with the British average consumption in 1960 of five ounces of butter, 35 ounces of meat, 51 ounces of potatoes, and 32 ounces of fruit. Consumption of basic foods in London in 1850, therefore, was similar to that of modern Britain. And there's no reason to think that the Englishman outside of London ate less well. So with other commodities. Furniture. China pottery and earthenware. Pots and pans, iron goods and cutlery. Coal for domestic use. Clothing and footwear. Boots began to take the place of clogs and hats replaced shawls, at least on Sundays. Pictures and ornaments. Books and magazines. The working class home, which before the Industrial Revolution had contained so little, now began to have its inventory. Most of the production of the Industrial Revolution was of consumer goods for the mass of the people. These people also were better housed. As the population of England and Wales increased from 9 million in 1801 to 18 million in 1851, there was a corresponding increase in the stock of houses. And as the census statistics show, there was a reduction in the number of persons per inhabited house. Most of the housing built during the Industrial Revolution consisted of substantial dwellings for the working classes. And the quality of housing, physical and architectural, can be seen today in the industrial areas of Lancashire and Yorkshire, in the Welsh mining villages, and in London and other ports. Such houses, maligned by some historians as the cruel habitations of the poor, are now sought after by the middle classes as desirable residences. There were certainly slums in the congested and poorer suburbs of the cities. But these slums were in specific areas where a minority of the poorest of working people lived. There was no more a general housing problem during the Industrial Revolution than there was a general food problem. But there was still poverty, and the very poor could afford only the meanest of accommodation, often in slums. The majority of the working people of the Industrial Revolution, however, were well housed, and some occupied houses often built by their employers, but are now recognized as architectural gems. <laughs>